Hey guys, something a bit different today. Um, so I was doing a V8 uh, mission with some of the guys. I'm just playing on a um, on like a what should we call it? Through the Inferno server. It was 107th, I think. And the server went reset on us. So with DCS already running. Um, I was gonna look for another server to do more helicopter stuff on. Turns out that Cold War was pretty populated and Red was badly outnumbered. It looked like they were having a really rough time with things. So I decided, you know what, I may as well hop on. I wasn't streaming at the time, well, well, I was, but just uh, to the guys in Discord, like I said, we we're doing a small sort of co op helicopter thing together. And so, naturally, because I wasn't streaming it, I ended up having probably one of the best runs I've had recently. With that said, it seems that track files kind of, sort of, mostly work for the MiG-21 now. At least they have the last few times I've tried them. It's still a bit hit and miss with other aircraft, but with the 21, uh, there is no more landing next to the runway or flying into mountains, it seems to be pretty much spot on. Mission is When the Mountains Cry. Uh, for those who aren't familiar enough with the Cold War server to know the missions by name, it's the one where blue and red fly over a series of lakes uh, in the area between southern Georgia, northeastern Turkey, and Armenia. This mission is usually alright. Uh, it can be a bit difficult to try and find uh, aircraft down in the, the valleys because the area that the lakes are in is quite hilly. There's a lot of terrain that people can mask in. Quite often the attackers will sit in the valleys and you'll not really know that they're there until the lake gets destroyed. In this case as well, we didn't have GCI at the time. We did have GCI later on, but to start with it was just AI that we were relying on. I'm flying with Yellow Fox as my wingman. I've been flying with this earlier in the helicopters and decided to hop over to this, where the rest of the guys decided to call it because it was getting quite late. Apologies if my audio levels are all fucked up, it's kind of late at night. I don't want to wake my neighbours up by now. Taking a fairly light load out for this one. Two R3R, two R60, and a fuel tank. Generally, if I'm expecting a dogfight, like if there's a lot of F5s about, I'll take the two R60s rather than four, just because the double racks are quite heavy and quite draggy. Now, it doesn't really affect the MiG-21 speed, it just has so much thrust that there's nothing really you can do to the MiG-21 to affect its speed or its acceleration. But what they do actually affect is its turning ability. Uh, I find that with the double racks I'm much more wobbly, I have a much harder time changing direction in a hurry, which is something you need to be able to do when dealing with F5s and so I just go for the singles. Taking the R3Rs because I'm expecting these guys to at least occasionally be high enough for the radar to come into use. So we're both ready on the runway and off we go. Now at the same time, just by happenstance, because we haven't coordinated this at all, uh, Yink and some of his guys, Sturdy and Maximus, were on at the same time, also flying 21s. Uh, Gato was on the other team, flying a Gazelle of the air ground variety. So there were plenty of streamers on, uh, but I think the only one actually streaming this was Yink. I've been thinking of doing like a MiG-21 sort of tutorial series at some point. 
I just haven't figured out how to approach it yet. I'll give you guys little tips here and there to sort of fill out the uh, transit flight to the front. First tip, don't come out of afterburner before 600 kilometers an hour. Um, one of the things that I see new MiG pilots doing a lot is as soon as the wheels are off the ground they cut back to mill power um, in the MiG-21 with a great big delta wing. That is not a smart idea. You're really relying on that afterburner to get you up to speed. And once you get up to speed, you can start dropping the nose, getting rid of some of that angle of attack. You can load the aircraft a bit, but if you come out of the burner too soon, uh, you're basically a brick. You have all the lift in the world, the problem is you also have all the drag in the world from generating said lift, and the aircraft will just pancake straight back into the runway. It's quite common to see. Uh, sometimes people save it at the last moment, sometimes they won't. So for the transit out to the combat area, I'm just staying sort of low enough to clear, well, high enough to clear the terrain, I should say, but low enough that uh, if I need to, I can get into a valley. I actually prefer taking the MIG up high, it's really where it was built to fly, but um, the server mitigate kind of dictates staying low. Most people will fly pretty much as low to the ground as they can go, uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is the F5s think we can't see them, if they do that, um, they're quite low on that count. Also, uh, just the general sort of valley masking mentality that a lot of DCS players have. I think also some of the F5 guys are at least dimly aware of the MiG-21's performance at high altitude, and they know that the F5, while it's basically a match for the MiG at low altitude, uh, the higher you go, the worse it gets. So while the two aircraft are almost perfectly even with each other on the deck, except uh, with an acceleration advantage in the MiG's case. Once you start building altitude, the MiG-21 acceleration and top speed both come into play. Uh, the climb rate also comes into play, really. It just, the 21 leaves the F5 for them on there. So I can understand that I'm really going high. Quite often, um, I'm sort of flying around 10, 15,000 feet, which is enough to pick up on the Particularly in areas like this where it's quite hilly and you will get people flying higher. Very rare to get them flying up in comms. Usually on the server you see a contrail, it's something like a Tomcat, maybe a Link 29, uh, or it's a Yink. And of course, I'm not turning my radar on yet. Uh, I usually wait until I'm quite close to the action before I do that. Mostly to save coolant, not so much because I'm concerned about giving away my position. Uh, the F5's RWR is quite good, it's a sort of tremendous anachronism. Uh, if, we, if, if we were really doing Cold War F5's, particularly 7-0, they wouldn't have that. They'd have like a, a cop buster, uh, police radar warning receiver. But um, I'm not too concerned about that. Most F5 pilots on the server either seem to have their RWR off, or they have it in the wrong mode, or they have it muted, they just don't check it, whatever. They're generally pretty unaware. The main concern is the core because you only have a limited supply of it. Uh, it's not difficult to renew it, you just have to run a repair on the aircraft, but it's time consuming. You don't really want to have to shut down the aircraft, wait for three minutes, then start it back up again just because I waste my vodka. I'm pretty sure the ground crew will be too happy about that. Typically for me, um, once I'm within about 30 to 40 kilometers of a known enemy. Um, that's when I start looking to switch the radar on and punch off the tank. Now, before punching off the tank in the MiG-21, you have to dial the fuel gauge back to 2800, uh, assuming it's not empty already. The reason for this being the MiG-21's fuel gauge is not actually a fuel gauge. It's just a fuel flow um, meter, I guess tied into a gauge which you tell it how much fuel is in the aircraft then it winds back from that. Uh, if you punch off a belly tank or a wing tank with some fuel left in it, you will not subtract what was in the tank when you punched it. It will just assume that it's still there. So you'll end up with a miscalculation and that will end in embarrassment. So here we go, we've got a two ship. I can visually see them off my nose because uh, DCS spotting is absolutely ludicrous. Got the radar up and running now. Tank's already gone. 
actually punch it off uh, on the way over because it emptied out. I'm just waiting to see if I can pick these guys up on the scope because I will be looking to do my usual. Or actually, I didn't actually punch a tank off yet, checking the fuel gauge on. Um, I'll be looking to do my usual attack, so we've got a two ship coming in high, that hot on me, there we go, there's me winding the gauge back and the tank is gone. I've got one on radar, I can't see the other. Just IFFing constantly to make sure that's still the same guy, he's still hostile. The second one hasn't come up yet. It's possible they're flying so close together that the radar can't tell them apart, I think it's just one big contact. I did lose him here for a moment, I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, I think at one point they did begin turning, so they may have just kind of minimised the closure right there. We've got him back, he kind of fades in and out. So because they're above me, because they're coming in head on, and probably unaware of me, I'm going to go for an R3R attack underneath. So I've got a lock on one of them now, turning in. Flipped my seek ahead selection switch down to semi active radar homing so that when I hold down the weapon release button and R3R will come off the rail on R60. Just flying the pipper on the radar screen onto the bird. There we go, we're in range. We've got our shoot cues. I usually fire both R3Rs at a single target to maximize chances of a hit and two hits. The other guy's just woken up after seeing his body get splashed violently in front of him. So we'll switch over to R60s and now we're in visual combat. I think that's Yellow Fox cutting up from underneath there. Got an R60 away on him. It looks like it's a big track. It's kind of a little sketchy aspect, but it did track him and it did kill him. Quickly check behind me. And we're good. Now at this point it was called out over comms from memory that there was an F-14 in the area. And it was quite close by. I can actually see it again because DCS spotting is ridiculous. Also because it's a big aircraft, it's just right in the middle of the, not the gun sight itself, but the reflector plate of the gun sight. Do you see the top of it there? So same thing again, except without the R3Rs. I'll be looking to pick him up on radar, use that to steer myself into him, possibly intimidate him, force him to turn away from me if he thinks he's about to be shot at and try and come up from underneath to get on his tail. Now Yellow Fox is going to be running in with Hack as well. He's going to try with R3Rs. Uh, he was separated off to my point by about one to two kilometers at a time. We're constantly on comms talking to each other. I was trying to give him the kill here, so I uh, told him to put himself in a position where he could get some R3Rs on this guy and I'd just be on standby in case anything happened. So we've got a lock here. Now, as well as giving me a steering cue in case I lose this guy visually, this also will add more confusion to what's going on in his cockpit because I'm locking him and the yellow fox is going to be locking him and he will not know which of us is going to be the shooter until the missiles are already away. Staying low here to try and avoid being spotted. If I can stay in his blind, so uh, blind spots as long as possible, it'd be good for me. Mi-21 is a tiny aircraft, it's extremely difficult to see, especially from the Tomcat, which has a very crowded sort of cockpit. Now at this point he actually started beaming, and uh, now I'm on his tail. Unbeknownst to me, there were another two Mi-21s in the area, one quite close, and this guy was reacting to them. I don't think he was aware of me and Yellow Fox at this point. So I'm pulling in on his tail at this point. Uh, I don't want to fire an R60, it's a bit far against an F-14, and I also wanted the Yellow Fox to take him. It turns out Yellow Fox is having some trouble getting a good shot on him, and this guy started actually exhibiting some awareness that he had a Mega behind him, so there's a shot from Yellow Fox, it was a bit close, and so I decided to commit and 
try and get in for an R60 and guns on this F14. I didn't actually realize it was an F14 until I saw him spread his wings. I thought it was just an F5. Two smoke trails. You know, from a distance they look kind of similar, except for the twin tail fins, which you can't see through the smoke. But right here I decided, you know what, I'll commit to it. And right there we get an R60 away. Squirt a gun just in case. And down goes our first Tomcat of the day. Now at this point, the other MiG-21 that was closest, uh, Vito I think it was, actually formed on my right wing. I didn't see him, so I was mostly looking out my left side, looking for Yellow Fox. But Vito actually formed on my right wing, and uh, right about that time, Sven in his F5 watched me splash Tomcat and couldn't get there in time to save him. Splashes Vito right next to me. You can actually see the puff from the missile there, and the actual missile trail from my Sven's shot. Those traces of Vito, you just started holding the trigger as he went down. Yeah, now, I'm not going to fight behind me. I'm very glad that Vito was just a little bit higher above the ground than me because uh, I think Sven saw him first and shot him with his last missile. He'd already been in a fight. So it's down to guns at this point. I'm normally pretty confident about my ability to gun kill an F5, but when they begin in the offensive position, it's pretty sketchy. You can see here I'm a little wobbly. I was under a bit of stress. You know, I wasn't expecting to be in a gunfight, and yet here I am. I've got no missiles left at all. I have no idea where my teammates are. It's just me and the F5. Now, uh, Yellow Fox did actually manage to sneak in and get a shot there but missed, and at that point he lost his engine. I think he uh, either oversped it or negative G'd it, but um, he had a flame out and he couldn't recover it. So he was basically out of the fight uh, from that point on. Right here I'm looking for a shot, not quite the right deflection, but we're putting some pressure on him. Even if these shots don't hit him, they'll certainly put him under the pump and maybe force him to make some mistakes like that. I don't know why he reversed there. He's trying to keep behind him. Nearly had another shot there. Now he is reversing to try and force an overshoot, but like I said, I'm pretty confident behind an F5. Um, I can kind of dance on the mix controls enough to keep it nice and stable, even at very low speeds. Essentially, when it comes to close combat, um, between two pilots of similar experience, whoever wins is the guy that started in the offensive position. Um, if an F5 gets on my tail, I have a lot of trouble getting rid of it. More often than not, they'll kill me. On the other hand, if I get it on the F5's tail, they're pretty much done. Periscope check there, just to make sure somebody else wasn't lining me up. Now you may have seen just how useful that periscope is. If I hadn't glanced up at the right time, I would never have spotted that missile trail, and I would never have known that Sven was behind me, and I would have been gunned I'm straight and level, totally unaware. There is absolutely no sane reason to use that periscope. It is excellent. Anyone that says it isn't doesn't know what they're talking about. It also doesn't actually affect performance as much as people think it does. So right here I'm looking for a shot, but I'm also kind of conscious of the fact he might be trying to bait me for someone, especially when he's leveled off like this. And I do completely potato my aim there, but I did land a couple of hits. Unfortunately, a couple of hits I did land distracted me long enough to let him put the fight back into a more neutral uh, situation. It does take a couple shots there as he sweeps across my tail, but he didn't hit me at all. So, with the fight, kind of not even really neutral at this point. He's actually in an offensive position now. Uh, and with my own fuel gauge looking pretty dicey, I just glanced down there and noticed it's time to go home. So I'm just accelerating away as quickly as I can. Emergency burner on, of course, always. Uh, if I'm below 4,000 meters and I'm in a dogfight, that emergency burner is on. Now, 
just trying to get away from him as quickly as possible once I'm certain I'm clear. I'll pull up zoom climb to a more sensible altitude for fuel economy and we'll just try and glide as far as we can basically. I should have just enough to make it home to Kadaisi but in case I'm a little short I'd like to have the altitude. So at this point I'm pretty sure I'm clean. Um, as it happens, TACView revealed that we both broke off from the engagement pretty much the same time. As soon as he saw me turn away, he also turned and headed home. Um, from checking the track file, I actually damaged him fairly badly. He still had both engines, I think, but his gear was all chewed up on one side, his tail was being more damaged, so he was probably not having a very fun time. I can't remember if Yellow Fox managed to get his engine restarted or not. I don't actually think he did. But there are other maybe airborne in the area, so I should be able to make it home pretty much on the west at this point. We're out of the woods. So pretty shortly I will be pulling up to begin my zoom climb. And then we'll just be smooth sailing from there, hopefully. So as far as the fuel indications on the MiG-21 go, uh, the fuel gauge is a handy reference, but remember, it's only accurate if you set it correct. Um, it will automatically set to the correct quantity of fuel on a rearm and refuel, but again, if you punch that tank off with fuel still in it, it's going to misread, and it's going to misread it high. So, as well as always resetting your fuel gauge 2800, which is full internal, uh, when you jettison your tanks, you have some fuel status lights next to it, they will tell you which fuel tanks are empty. The top light is your suspended fuel tanks, the belly tank, the wing tanks. The light below that is the main group of tanks that will come on, uh, it's just below a thousand litres, so like uh, 800 litres, somewhere around that, that light will come on. Then you'll see the red light that was just blinking there, that's your 450 litre warning. And then once you get down to the last of your fuel, about 200 litres or so, uh, you'll see the final fuel light come on. And once that light comes on, you have a couple of minutes of flying time left. Ideally, you want to be already home, uh, preferably within about 50 to 100 kilometres of home when the 450 litre warning comes on. Uh, you want to be even closer if you're at low altitude. If you're higher, you have more to play with. This mission tends to stretch my fuel quite a bit. Uh, flying from Kutaisi to an objective that's most of the way to Tbilisi over the mountains, throw in two to three fights. Um, usually in this mission I come back on fumes. A couple of times I've had to actually dead stick the aircraft either back on Kutaisi or on uh, one of the smaller airstrips within the city. Unfortunately those aren't considered to be airports as such by the game, so you can't re uh, refuel at them, you can't save the aircraft slot or anything. I've also had to belly land a couple of times, it's taken me <laughs> quite a bit of practice to really figure out the optimal amount of fuel to return home with, shall we say. At this point I realised I'd actually forgot to tune my RSBN during startup, so that's what I'm doing here. And that will give me a direction and distance back home. So I'm 99 kilometres, and my 450 litre warning has come on solid, which means I am below 450 litres. I think I actually wound my fuel gauge back a little too far because it's reading lower than I would expect, but that's actually a good thing because it kind of keeps me honest. Radar's been switched fully off. It does consume some coolant while in standby mode, so if you are done using it for the next 10 minutes at least, turn it off. Uh, if you're expecting to need to use it again shortly, don't turn it off, just put it on standby. It takes uh, several minutes to warm back up. So usually while I'm refueling around, Rather back to Scotland. 
guys, he's up ahead in the distance, just past that bend in the river. We should actually be able to see the airports now. So for our first sortie of the day, uh, it was a R3R kill on an F5, shortly followed by an R60 kill on his wingman. We managed to get an R60 kill on a Tomcat, and then uh, followed it up with a damaged F5. He did make it back to base safely. He had to uh, make a fairly spicy landing, but he got down okay. Blinking light on the fuel indicator, uh, fuel indication even panel is telling me I'm down to my last group of tanks. So when that comes on, that means you really need to be close to home. You can see the short airstrips in Kutaisi and now the actual airbase off in the distance. So even if the engine cut now, I should have just enough altitude to make it to one of the shorter airstrips. But I know I've got enough fuel that I can make it back to the airport and I should even have enough to land normally if you want a dead stick. If you do have to make a dead stick landing in the MiG-21, there are a couple of important things to know. The first one is not to drop your gear or flaps until you are already over a runway, or at least very, very close to one. You have to know that you're going to make it. Um, ideally, I wouldn't even use flaps unless you're already fast and high. If you need to bleed the speed, drop the flaps. If you don't, if you're already on speed or a bit slow, do not put the flaps down. They're blown flaps. They require bleed air off the engine to actually produce enough lift. And so really, uh, if your engine's dead and you drop the flaps, all you're doing is putting out a lot of drag for no return. It's just like putting the air brakes down, pretty much. If you have to land off a runway that is on an unprepared field out in the stick somewhere. Don't drop the landing gear. Put the air brakes down before you touch. Uh, official procedures to drop the nose wheel, uh, like the nose wheel separately. There's a pull handle between your legs for that. But I find in DCS that's quite dangerous as the game's physics can flip you upside down very, very easily. So I just put out the air brakes. You do have three of them, two up front, big one in back, and they kind of act like skids. Uh, it keeps the aircraft mostly off the ground during the landing. Also helps slow it down much faster, and it should keep you the right way up, unless you land with a lot of slip. At this point, I'm quite certain I'm going to make it come off the power. We're pretty much at flight idle now, just coasting down. I am at the uh, sort of maximum gear and flaps deployment speed. Well, gear deployment speed, there is no maximum flaps deployment. But again, I'm going to wait until I know for sure that the engine's not going to quit on me. actually see the fuel gauge is reading zero. Uh, like I said, I actually overdid it a bit when I wound it back. It shouldn't be reading that low. I think there's about 50 to 100 litres left in the tank. are out now because I do need to actually slow down to drop the gear and flaps. I know for sure that I am going to make it now. The engine is not likely to quit on me at this distance. 
so gear down, get the flaps out, and then we'll just take on the rest of the way. I'm looking for an approach speed of about 350 to 400 kilometers an hour, somewhere in that range. Um, that's really the most comfortable speed to approach at. Much faster than that, you're going to have a bad time. Much slower than that, you're going to drop from the sky like a rock. The MiG-21's engine really doesn't have the response time you need to come in slow. Uh, ideally, you want to be a little bit fast or, you know, on speed, so to speak. That's the outer marker. Approach is still looking good. Sitting about five units of AOA. Usually you'd be looking for about five to ten on approach. We're a little fast, 420 kilometers an hour. Definitely don't want to blaze it on this landing. So I'm just bringing the nose up gently. And then over the threshold I'll put in a nice big flare and let that huge delta wing do the air braking for me. Touch down at about 310 kilometers an hour. Parachute goes out, slow me down. And we're home safe. Usually when I'm waiting for the ground crew to do their thing, I'll start configuring the aircraft for takeoff again. So, I have a certain trim setting when I use for takeoff, uh, just because I don't have a realistic sort of MiG-21 length stick extension. Uh, I have a lot less leverage to work with, and uh, it can be quite twitchy if I don't pull the right amount of stick. So rather than risk that and tail scraping, I usually set a bit of back trim and uh, just ease the stick back on takeoff. I found that trying to take off with no trim, just stick movement, it was way too wobbly for me. Maybe if I get a stick extension someday, I won't need to, but for now it helps. So I usually, uh, right here I'm doing it, so I set it back to the trim neutral light, and then back until the light goes out, and then three or four clicks back from that. One nice thing about the MiG-21's relatively small fuel capacity is the fact that it's really quick to turn around. Uh, it's not like the Su-27 where you have to wait a century for it to refuel. This was me playing with the brightness knob for the range scale there on the ASP. I could never remember what that knob did. Uh, so I started playing with it and then I realized that's what it actually controls, is the brightness on those range scales. Pulled just a little under 9G during that flight. Now, technically, MiG-21 gets his service limited to 8.5. Uh, the ARU will generally try and stop you from pulling too much G, but there's certain speed ranges where it can't keep up. Um, and particularly with my style of going straight vertical in the merge, I wash off a lot of speed very quickly and the ARU just can't keep up with me. 
so uh, it, it is something to watch out for, especially if you tend to go vertical in mergers. You have to be careful about how much stick you pull, because if you have that thing pulled all the way into your lap and the ARU cranks over too quickly, you're going to lose your wings. The aircraft will tolerate up to about 11 or 12 G, um, but if you overstress it by more than about 9, and then do that a couple more times, the wings will come off. Uh, they sort of become progressively less tolerant of it the more you push the G's. So staying sort of in the region of 8 to 9 is ideal. You can scrape 10 once or twice, but I would not recommend it. Just like that, we're good to go again. Now, like I was saying before, to refill the radar coolant, you have to actually go for a full repair. Generally, I won't do that until the coolant runs out, or if I've been flying the same aircraft for more than about an hour and a half, which is quite rare. Usually, I get shot down at least once in that kind of time period. I have had the coolant run out on me. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. You'll know when it's happened because it comes up with a status light on the radar scope that tells you to turn it off, uh, and you'll also see a red light next to the power light for the radar down those uh, switches down the bottom right by your right knee. Somewhere around here, Yink actually hopped into my Discord, which is where I was talking to Yellow Fox. Uh, so we did have some kind of coordination going on. I was also on SRS, so Yink hopped on there as well. Shortly after I take off here, he actually asked me if I wanted to fly together. So you'll see me circle back around the airport while I wait for him. exceed about 15 to 20 degrees. Uh, if you exceed that, you're going to tail scrape. The aircraft has enough power that usually it will clear the ground before there's too much risk of a tail scrape, but if you pull the stick really aggressively, like I've seen some people do, uh, you will absolutely smash a tail end. And with that, you also have a heavy risk of stalling back into the runway, particularly with heavy loads. Now, two R3Rs and two R60s are fairly light loaded, plus the 800 litre belly tank. Um, with the extra two R60s on the double racks, you do feel the difference in weight, particularly on takeoff. But the worst defenders are air to ground stores, and if you're carrying an air to ground loaded out, particularly one with heavy bombs, you'll really notice it. The aircraft just really doesn't seem to want to get into the air once the wheels come off the runway. So it's generally advisable to wait a bit before you bring the gear up. Whereas with the lighter air to air load out, so you can just pull the gear as soon as the wheels come off the ground. You can see the distance counter for the RSBN ticking away there on the right hand side. I usually tune that to my home airfield and just leave it run. Kind of as my um, go home reference. Depending on what altitude I'm flying, it can also help me figure out how far I'm from the airfield. Um, RSBN is a line of sight radio system though, so if you have terrain blocking you or if you're too low or just too far away, you won't pick it up. 
if you don't have an RSBN signal, usually the first way to remedy this is to climb. Eventually you'll capture it. Some people find it annoying, I actually don't. I find it kind of soothing, like it becomes MiG-21 ASMR after a while. Um, I don't like muting it because quite often it's my primary indication that somebody's about to try and kill me. Uh, if that thing comes on with a solid buzzing tone, it means that somebody's above you and you're about to have a really bad day. It's not as bad as people say it is. Um, once you get used to it, you can actually build some kind of situational awareness from what it tells you, but it obviously is inferior to what they have as an MCS. So I spotted Yink. He's uh, dropped back in behind me somewhere, but I did see him and he saw me. So I'm just going to head towards the target area and he will rejoin up on me in his own time. observant among you may have noticed that uh, if I turn around in my seat, I can see behind the red star on the wing. If I look up in the periscope, I can see past the red star on the wing. So contrary to popular belief, the MiG-21 does not have a blind spot behind and above itself, only behind and below, which is the same as virtually any other jet in DCS. Um, things like the F-16 and Hornet can only barely see better behind themselves. I don't know if I'd even say they can see themselves better than the 21. The primary issue, as far as visibility goes, is the spine of the aircraft's quite fat, um, and the low-mounted delta wings as well, but in the way. So behind and below is really the biggest problem, but that's true in every aircraft, just about. So there's Yink, sporting his Mongolian Air Force skin, which he made himself. Having a little bit of a shaky day, I think. <laughs> we all have them. No matter how much you fly this thing in DCS, you will have good days and bad days. I, you know, occasionally contract the wobbles myself and I just can't stop doing it. And there's the man himself. Yink is definitely one of the best MiG-21 pilots that I've come across in DCS. Um, good sticks in the 21, a few and far between, and generally uh, we all tend to know each other, but Yink is uh, somebody that I check under my bed for before I go to sleep at night, put it that way. Yink, Davy and Zachrix are probably the three best 21 pilots in the server. flying form on the left side, whereas I'm most comfortable flying form on the left side. You'll 
whereas he's bought the double rack R60s. The Inc. generally brings double racks. Um, he's willing to sacrifice stability in turns for the extra missiles. And you can see how winding the blue gauge back is. We've had it called out fairly close. Um, Warp Hammer, my personal GCI, so to speak, has hopped on and has spotted something near our farm. Now, belly tank is extra weight and drag in combat, you really don't want it there. Um, if you pull enough G's, it will fall off of its own accord, especially if it's still got fuel in it. That's not really something you want to do. So, anytime I'm expecting combat, you know, within a short time span, I will get rid of the tank, whether or not it's empty. When the MiG-21 stalls, if you happen to be in a turn at the time, it develops quite a violent... Um, it's not even so much of a wing lock as a tail wag. Um, it kind of just viciously slews from one side to the other. And the natural instinct a lot of people have is to try and counter it. Um, with a wing, because when you drop it first, it will start stamping the rudder, which is... Either of them are about the worst possible thing you could do. When you get the wobbles, you really need to let the aircraft just fix itself. Hands and feet off the controls, it will right itself eventually. If you don't have the altitude, you might be able to kind of squeeze a little bit of back stick out of it without making the problem worse, but it's really a thing that comes with experience. You can use it tactically in fights. Um, quite often, if I'm worried, I'm going to overshoot somebody and I don't have time to rely on the air brakes to deliberately induce the wobble because it will slow me down and change my direction quickly. You can also force people to overshoot with it. Um, it makes you very difficult to hit, but it's not ideal as a gun jink because it slows you down a lot. And there's a risk that uh, the wobble will continue long enough to negative G the engine and then you'll have a flame out with somebody behind you, which is about the worst possible thing that could happen. So generally I try and avoid them, I just try and keep the aircraft at or below its critical angle. Um, if you go into a stall symmetrically, which is say you know, the user level, um, the aircraft will tend to just kind of drop. Um, it won't your roll or anything nasty like that, it just drops, it stops going forwards and starts going down. Um, which can be quite handy. It's not really a cobra, but you can pull something that looks kind of like one. Um, and it's quite comfortable for the aircraft to recover itself, no problems. Again, I wouldn't recommend it in combat necessarily. Uh, it slows you down, makes you a big target, easy to hit, especially to something else like, you know, another MiG-21 or an F5 that has the nose authority to pull with you. But it is an option. As a general rule, if the MiG-21 does something you didn't tell it to do, just release the controls and it'll, it'll fix itself. It's a, a pretty well-behaved aircraft. It certainly doesn't hold your hand like the F-5 does, but... It gives you a lot more slack than some aircraft will. Um, you know, it'll, it'll punish bad flying, but... It won't punish it severely. So we're just flying past our FARP here, which I didn't actually realise uh, just at the moment. Because right about here, we get called merged. And just out of sort of immediate reflex, the two of us split. I begin a left hand circle, looking above me to see if anyone's behind. This is sort of the usual routine of a Cold War server. If a MiG or an F5 can't see what's in the him, he'll just go into it. Sort of circle in one direction looking above himself, so across the circle. That's where I realized where it popped far. It's quite distinctive. So I know that we at least have friendly shore ad cover here, if nothing else. Now it turns out what we actually merged with was Helgato in his gazelle. Uh, in fact, I was so busy looking above me for an F5, I didn't see him, but he's right off my nose, uh, right about him now. Just like a single tiny black dot against the ground, running away from us. He must have been harassing some of our far air defences. He's actually right there, 
I walked right out of it and I didn't see him. So Yink and I are kind of searching independently around the farm for a minute or two, just to make sure that we are clear, make sure that uh, there isn't an F5 or a Vigan or something lurking in the valleys. I actually saw that gun burst in game. I just saw it there in the periscope. I don't remember if I noticed that in game. It may have actually been uh, in Gato engaging our Cub site because there's a Cub site quite near the far because they were foot past, I think. Just doing a low pass here to check. Looking for any damage, any signs that someone has attacked it. I'm keeping an eye on the radar as well. Because what I do not spot with my eyes, I might spot the radar. But right here, I'm spotting a dot above the mountains, off in the distance. Too low, we're probably too far away from the radar. You and I did start coordinating again here. I didn't actually know where he was, but I assumed he was kind of in the same general area as me. Uh, he was actually displaced by a couple of holes. I think that may be him in the front right corner. I don't know if you can see there's a dot track in the same direction as me for my uh, one o'clock. I think that may have been Yink. So he was calling out two contacts um, to his one o'clock, and I looked to my one o'clock. I think I ended up mistaking a pair of friendlies for a pair of incoming enemies, which is what he could see. So there was a little bit of confusion around here. Uh, the end result of that was he getting into a merge before I could get there. So right here is where I spot that single dot. I think that is actually a yank. And I spot another potentially two over there. The dot of my nose is IFF friendly, but there's a second crossing I can't see it on radar. The SPO is also going ballistic because something is spiking me. Now, in hindsight, that was probably our cook battery that I flew past. Um, I was just getting caught in its side lobe as it locked the F5s in front of me. But I uh, just did a quick check to make sure I was clear. There was no sneaky F5 roll. Point. At this point, uh, Yink is, I think, pretty close to being merged. I now see three out dropped off my right side and decide to head that way instead. We've got two enemy coming up on the radar. Someone's already been splashed. This was actually Yink's merge, so Yink just hit someone with an R3R. But, it looked like he was still flying, in fact it looked like he was trying to climb up after Yink. As it turns out, this F5 had both his wings blown off and his pilot killed him as well, truly dead. I put an R3R into him just to be sure. Uh, sometimes F5s can be a bit zombie-ish, in fact his pilot objective right there. Um, so I like to make extra sure they are actually dead and shot down enough times by a guy I thought I killed to not care if I waste my son. So the other F5 is on the Yink's tail and it died. I actually fired an R3R at him there and did not expect it to hit. I dropped a lock and thought that for sure the missile had been trashed. But it turns out that R3R actually did a really nice dive down on him and smacked him. Um, not the kind of shot I would ever expect that missile to make, but it did make it quite that way. We've got another enemy aircraft mix. Um, at some point in here, Yink gets shot down. I'm looking for where that hostile was that was on my radar, but I don't see him. That over there, I think, is Yink's wreck. And so now I'm blind and there's an F5 somewhere around, which is no idea.
punching out flares every few seconds just in case there is a missile coming for me. We've got a friendly merge with an enemy directly off winner is very close. That's the 21 above me. You can tell by the traces and the massive blow towards an afterburner. And that being F5. Maneuver kills himself. Um, it's kind of common in the F5, I do it to myself as well. You don't have as much pull as you do in the MiG-21, so you don't leave enough room to recover from a dive. Um, it's chronic among MiG-21 players that always sort of fly the F5. It's probably the quickest way to spot a MiG-21 pilot, is put them in an F5 and see if they slam into the ground coming out of the dive. Like that. Now I do have another enemy coming in, or at least nearby. He's actually running away, that's why I can't walk in. I've got the radar and it's a low closure rate mode and it's still going to pick him up. It sees him, it just can't lock. But I can also see him visually at this point. So it's not a big deal. In fact, uh, that is not him visual, that is the two ship he's baiting me into. So he's uh, quite low off my nose in the tree line. Actually, that's it then. My bad, he was above me. Now we're going to go for the two ship. That's the biggest threat. The single ship's running for dear life, so I'll try and take these two. They may not even be right here. Now, at this point, I shoot up through the vertical, almost between them. At first, I thought they were on the back because they didn't seem to be reacting, but then the lead begins turning, and sure enough, they see me. The other MiG 21 is Maximus, I think. I did take a shot there in the merge, but it didn't connect. And immediately, I am behind one of the F5s. A little bit of a wobble there. I just ease off the controls, let the aircraft sort of have its moment, and then we're back in action. If I had tried to double down on the control input there, I would have probably ended up upside down. It's very hard to spin the MiG-21, and if it does end up in a spin, it tries to get itself out. Right basically self-recovers, but uh, a wobble is definitely not something you want in combat, it loses your precious time. So I get some guns into that F5 and then notice through the periscope, again the amazing periscope, that the other one's right on my tail. He's already wasted missiles at me. Like most F5 players, he's firing them way too close, probably not even uncaging them, so I have no chance of hitting him. And I know Maximus is there, backing me up, so I can kind of afford to extend a little bit, build my speed back up. And at this point, I actually just decide to egress from the area completely. It's getting a bit too spicy for me. I'm glad I did at this point, because about three hours. shot the guy off my tail and got shot by another F5 that came in on my team. And then the F5 that I hit, surprisingly, actually linked back home and landed. Um, I think it was his wing fuel tank burning, but other than that, he seemed to have a lot of engine that seemed to be controllable, so I didn't finish the job. But he did overrun and land and end up in the approach fighting, so good enough. At this point, I look at the fuel gauge and uh, have a minor heart attack. I am 102 kilometers from home, and I have probably about 200 meters, maybe 300 meters of fuel left, um, so reasonably low. I had to stay in line for quite a while there, just to make sure that my own table was clear. I wanted to get away from that area as fast as I could. I realized that at this distance there's virtually zero hope of me making it back to Kutaisi, any of the airfields of Kutaisi with a single fuel um, from about 100 kilometers away. But we do have a road base down here in this valley, so I start looking for it. Now unfortunately, it's not very clearly marked, there's no uh, smoke markers, nothing like that. The only way to visually spot it is to fly an inspection pass down the road 
and see the, uh, was it like two jeeps and a couple guys standing around? That's the road base. I didn't have the fuel to do that, so I just flew down the valley and kind of picked a straight looking piece of road and hoped that was it. As it turns out, I was 10 kilometers too far east. Um, if I'd just stayed high a little more and just glided down, I probably would have been fine. Best case scenario, I land at road base, top off the fuel, fly back to Kutaisi and uh, keep flying this airplane, but just to spoil the surprise of what's coming, um, because I couldn't find the road base itself, I landed too far down the road and my landing was also a bit rough. Um, because my engine died on the approach, I had to kind of crab the aircraft in. Um, it came in very steep and very fast, and so when I touched down I was actually about two meters to the right hand side of the road, uh, ended up in the grass, did some damage to the suspension, um, but the aircraft was mostly fine. It just rolled back onto the road and then stopped from there. So it was definitely repairable damage, uh, if only I had landed in the right place. You can see me looking at the map here trying to figure out which part of the road it's on. It's actually, I think, up ahead past that fork in the river, so it's about my, uh, like if you look at my gun paper, it's about 2 o'clock, or if it's that, 3 o'clock from that now. But I couldn't see it from there, so I just had to guess. telling me the service tank is empty. That means the last 80 litres of fuel in the aircraft is about to run out. So I know I really have to land now. I don't have time to fly any further down the road looking for it. I decide the section of road that I just flew over is close enough. But, of course, my approach here leaves a lot to be desired. fast enough on the rudder here and so I drift down into the grass, touch pretty hard and then because of the grass having equivalent friction to sandpaper, uh, the aircraft nearly tips over but I managed to save it and we are down safe. If only the guys from the road base would drive the fuel truck 10 kilometers down the road, I could have fueled up here and taken off. So that's pretty much it for this mission. Um, I did fly out in the MiG-19. I think I flew two or three sorties in the 19 after this, but pretty much nothing happened. Uh, most of the blues either disconnected or didn't take off. Uh, I did have one brief engagement in the 19 right at the end of the mission, uh, about an hour or so later, but Zach got the kill. Um, I thought that I might need to shoot the guy off of him, but he managed to take him himself. So overall, pretty productive session. It was uh, four kills, five if you want to count the guy that overran the runway. Um, one damaged, and we got an assist as well on an F5 by dragging him for Maximus. Unfortunately, Maximus was kind of getting dragged as well. So it was pretty good. I was pretty happy with that. Anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching. And I will catch you on the next one.